my name is Leo Ballester, and I am an assistant professor in molecular pathology and neuropathology at the Department of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine in the University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston. Today, I will be talking about integrating imaging histology, immunohistochemistry, and molecular information in the diagnosis of central nervous system tumors. So here is a general model for the diagnosis of, of CNS tumors. It, it's an outdated model where we incorporate some clinical history, gross examination, microscopic examination of, of the tissue. We add some immunohistochemical markers and we arrive at, at a diagnosis. Um, in, in certain settings, the, the clinical history that's available uh, it, it's minimal and maybe all that's available is brain tumor, which is, which is very limited information. And, and in many cases, um, the gross examination um, doesn't play a, a critical role in, in the diagnosis of, of brain tumors. And I'm, I'm referring to gross examination of the tissue because the tissue that comes out of the operating room is very frequently fragmented and all these uh, tissue fragments uh, provide very limited information on, on gross examination. However, the, in 2021, the diagnosis of, of CNS tumors incorporates a, a lot of information. Um, and and we, we can take these eight data sphere model for oncologic diagnosis as, as the basis for CNS tumor diagnosis. When we incorporate the age of the patient, gender, clinical history, anatomic location of the lesion, imaging characteristics, histology, differentiation markers, and molecular signature. And, and here in the center where all these spheres overlap, we arrive at a precise diagnosis. And imaging, for example, is critical for accurate diagnosis of CNS tumor. And here we can see uh, MRI scans for 12 different lesions. And just by looking at the imaging, we can generate a differential diagnosis. We can come up with a likely candidate for what is the most likely uh, diagnosis for each of these particular patients without looking at the tissue, without looking uh, under the microscope, without any immunohistochemical stains, no sequencing, no molecular information. Just by taking one look at these MRIs, we can generate a very uh, useful differential diagnosis, which, which is critical. Um, in many cases, for all of these lesions, the tissue will come out of the operating room in a container. The container will be labeled brain tumor. Now, the differential diagnosis for this brain tumor will be very, very different uh, than the differential diagnosis for this brain tumor or for this other brain tumor. So brain tumor doesn't really tell us much. But in many cases, this is how the containers come uh, out of the operating room. So, so we have to do, we have to go further, dig deeper and obtain additional information by going to the medical record and actually looking at the MRI images when, whenever possible. As you can see here, just by looking at the MRIs, we can come up with what is the most likely diagnosis for, for many of these lesions. A ven intraventricular lesion would be an ependymoma. Cis with a mural nodule in the cerebellum. Uh, in, especially the cerebellum of a child, pilocytic astrocytoma will be the most likely lesion. Uh, intraventricular lesion, but in, in the posterior horn of the ventricle, this could be an intraventricular meningioma. Pituitary adenomas, this uh, diffuse hyperintense intensity involving both hemispheres. Astrocytoma, most likely low-grade astrocytoma, IDH mutant, multiple lesions, uh, ring enhancing, smooth 
as opposed to this irregular ring enhancing lesion down here, which would be classic for glioblastoma. This would be an infectious uh, etiology, most likely. Enhancement in the pineal region to consider germinoma. You can see here how the pons, the, the brainstem is expanded by this hyperintense lesion that it's a classic presentation for a diffuse midline glioma. And we know now that many of these lesions, the great majority of these lesions have an H3K27M mutation. So this would be a diffuse midline glioma H3K27M mutant. So we can even anticipate what the molecular alteration of a lesion is going to be by just taking a look at the, at the imaging. Multiple lesions, metastases, we already talked about glioblastoma. Uh, this uh, periventricular enhancement, uh, frequently seen in CNS lymphomas. You see this superficial lesion with a dural tail there, this uh, smooth uh, interface with the brain. This would be classic for a uh, WHO grade one meningioma. And this is very powerful before going to do a frozen section. Uh, diagnosis or before going to intraoperative consultation, just having this information available can make a huge difference uh, and, and it can make a difficult frozen very easy if we know the location and the imaging characteristics of the lesion. So the, so there are some key, key imaging findings in, in some common CNS tumors. As I mentioned, this is critical for intraoperative consultation and the location of the lesion is, is critical. In some cases, extraaxial contrast enhancing mass with a dural tail, uh, right? That's classic for a particular lesion. We have other instances of an in intraaxial frontal lobe mass with contrast enhancement in an old patient. And that generates a different set of uh, possibilities in, in the differential diagnosis. Spinal cord lesions, they're divided in, uh, as intradural or extradural, or intramedullary or extramedullary. And, and all of these scenarios also generate a uh, set of possibilities, conus medullaris, lesions, several pontine angle mass. So if, if we look at this, for example, an extraaxial contrast enhancing mass with a dural tail, meningioma would be number one in the differential diagnosis. A frontal lobe mass with contrast enhancement in an old patient it's glioblastoma, spinal cord, an intradural, extramedullary lesion, meningioma, uh, peripheral nerve sheath tumor would be another possibility. Intramedullary lesions would be gliomas, right? Estrocytoma, ependymomas, or non neoplastic lesions. Conus medullaris, makes a papillary ependymoma, would be uh, most likely the, the diagnosis, followed by paraganglioma of the phylum, which is. Uh, a lot less common than mixopapillary ependymomas. Cerebellopontine angle mass, the contrast enhancement, schwannoma, 90% of the time this would be schwannoma. Second most common lesion at, that, at this side would be a meningioma. And it's actually possible to have a very good idea of schwannoma versus meningioma in this setting because schwannomas will in, uh, involve the internal auditory canal and that can be seen by imaging whereas meningiomas would not uh, show involvement of the um, internal auditory canal. So just by looking at the imaging, we can have a pretty good idea of schwannoma versus meningioma in the cerebral pontine angle region. This with a mural nodule in the posterior fossa of a child, pallocytic astrocytoma would be the most common, hemangioblastoma would be second. On imaging, they look very similar, cyst with a mural nodule. Uh, in the setting of an adult, this, this would be reversed and hemangioblastoma would be more common than pilocytic astrocytoma. This with a mural nodule in the temporal lobe of a young patient, especially a young patient presenting with seizures, ganglioglioma, pleomorphic astrocytoma, pilocytic astrocytoma would be common entities. Clibus, scordoma, multiple masses, metastases. So for example, it's, it's very easy to look at this uh, MRI scan, this axial T1 image with contrast enhancement. And you can see uh, a dural tail here, 
we can see that the lesion shows homogeneous contrast enhancement. There's another lesion showing similar characteristics here. These are multiple meningiomas, and, and it's almost certain that that's going to be the diagnosis even before uh, examining the tissue available. This is what the tissue looked like. Here we have gross examination of, of this lesion, shows this uh, fibrous appearance with a yellow color. And the touch preparation shows these cells with intranuclear inclusions uh, in distinct cytoplasmic borders, this wispy cytoplasm, as we call it. Uh, you can see in the touch also some whorls, uh, some oma bodies, and, and this is a, a meningioma. But, but we were almost certain, perhaps 90% certain or 95% certain that this was going to be the diagnosis before looking, looking at the tissue. And that's how powerful imaging imaging can be. Now, histology is critical for accurate diagnosis of, of brain lesions. We've, we've known that there is a, a large amount of information that we have acquired over the years uh, regarding the histologic features of different, uh, different CNS tumors. And, and we can look at a glass slide under the microscope and uh, come up with very precise diagnosis. Now, in some cases, histology alone is insufficient. For example, in this distinction of astrocytoma versus oligodendroglioma, uh, the, the distinction based on histology alone can be very difficult. That's why for many years, we were using this uh, diagnosis of oligoastrocytoma because there was a lot of overlapping histologic features. More recently, with the incorporation of molecular alterations, it has become easier to separate astrocytoma from oligodendroglioma. And, and I will be talking uh, about that in more detail in, in the next uh, slides. And there are key histologic findings that are associated with common CNS tumors, whorls and some of my bodies. Uh, for example, it's meningioma, pseudopalisane necrosis and vascular proliferation is classic for glioblastoma, perinuclear clearing, which we frequently see in oligodendroglioma, Rosenthal fibers using the granular bodies that should raise the diagnosis of pilocytic astrocytoma, sweat keratin, stellar reticulum, basaloid cells with peripheral palisading, classic histologic features for adamantinomatous cranopharyngioma, perivascular pseudo rosettes, of course, ependymoma. We have other types of rosettes, homeride rosettes in metroblastoma, flexner wintersteiner rosettes in retinoblastomas. We have these large branching vessels, which we also call staghorn vessels in solitary fibrous tumor. So histology is, is very, very powerful. And molecular alterations are also critical for the diagnosis of CNS tumors, and they're becoming more critical uh, as, time, uh, as time progresses. Uh, here we have an example of 1p19q codeletion, where here you can see the DAPI staining of the nucleus of this cell. Uh, in, you see we have two probes, a red probe uh, binding to the P arm of chromosome one and a green probe binding to the Q arm of chromosome one. And you see how we have two signals, so two Q arms, but only one red signal, so only one P arm. So the other P arm is deleted. So this is 1p deletion and the same I see down here uh, with the difference that now we are using probes for 19Q uh, and 19P. And you can see that there's two P but only one signal for 19Q. This is one P19Q correlation, which we frequently see in oligodendrogliomas. And in a small percentage of glioblastomas, uh, this can be seen as a non-specific finding. I'll be talking a little bit about that uh, later. And there are key molecular alterations that are present in common uh, CNS tumors. This fusion between BRAF and KIAA1549, uh, for example, it's classic in pilocytic astrocytomas. BRAF V600E mutation is seen in, in um, a few uh, different uh, CNS tumors, including pleomorphic santa astrocytoma, pilocytic astrocytomas, gangliogliomas. So you can see that there is some overlap in genetic alterations among different tumor types, IDH1 or IDH2 mutations, which are uh, 
frequently seen in infiltrating gliomas, in astrocytomas, as well as oligodendrogliomas. We have loss of ATRX, mutations in, in ATRX that cause loss of ATRX expression in astrocytomas, 1P19Q correlation in oligodendrogliomas, which I just showed you, terpromotor mutations, which are free, very frequent in glioblastomas, as well as oligodendrogliomas. But the catenin mutations in uh, wind altered medulloblastomas. So this is a subgroup of medulloblastomas that has better prognosis. Uh, they're also very common in adamantinomatous craniopharyngiomas, about 100% or greater than 95% of adamantinomatous craniopharyngiomas will have beta-catenin mutations. Uh, INI1 mutations in a typical teratoid rather tumors. Uh, this fusion between NAP2 and STAT6 in solitary fibrous tumors. And there's an antibody against STAT6 that can help uh, identify cases that have this fusion by showing nuclear expression. Uh, nuclear localization of the of the fusion protein and histone mutations, particularly histone three H three K twenty seven M mutation, which is a defining alteration for diffuse midline glioma H three K twenty seven M mutant, and you'll be hearing more about this entity in the next presentation by Dr. Velasquez. Uh, I just mentioned there. Molecular alterations are, are very powerful and in, in defining homogeneous groups uh, when it comes to brain tumors, but, but there is overlap. And, and for example, if you look at the BRAF V600E mutation is present in, in PXAs, gangliogliomas, pilocytic astrocytomas, glioblastomas, craniopharyngiomas. Similarly, terpromotor mutations are present in glioblastoma and, and oligodendroglioma. So, so one mutation alone is not sufficient to, to make a diagnosis, for example. But in, in some cases, what we're finding is that a combination of alterations is, is very powerful. And for example, terpromotor mutations with an IDH mutation, it's, it's almost diagnostic of oligodendroglioma because that combination of an IDH1 or an IDH2 mutation with a terpromotor mutation is not seen in, in glioblastomas. It's not seen in any other type of, of brain tumor. Um, similarly for PXA is a combination of PRAF B600E with loss of CDKN2A uh, and CDKN2B. It's, it's almost a molecular signature for, for PXA. So, BRAF CDKN2AB loss uh, is very frequent in, in PXA and it's rarely seen in other, in other brain tumors. And uh, what we've seen is that the number of entities that are defined by a molecular alteration continues to increase. Um, I think the uh, hematopathology um, WHO classification system relied heavily on, on molecular alterations since, since 2008. And for example, there are about 24 disease entities that had a molecular alteration as part of their name. And that number increased in the uh, subsequent uh, release of the WHO in 2017 for, for hematopathology. In 2007, the WHO for CNS tumors, there were zero. There were no tumor types that had a molecular alteration as part of their name. In 2016, that number increased to 17, and that number is going to increase even more uh, now in 2021 when the uh, fifth edition of the WHO is, is released. Now for, for other areas of, of pathology, like in 2017 WHO for endocrine lesions, there's no entity that it has a molecular alteration as part of, of the name. But this is a trend that, that we've seen in hematopathology and now we are definitely seeing in, in CNS tumors. Now, all this information that I mentioned that is required to make a diagnosis is available to the pathologist via the electronic medical record system. And perhaps this is the first time in history where uh, pathologists have all the required information to make a precise diagnosis because of the electronic medical record system, which this wasn't possible before incorporation of the, of the EMRs. We, we will have uh, access to histology and, and differentiation markers, but we wouldn't have 
access to imaging or, or some uh, limited access to, to clinical history before the electronic medical record became uh, widely used. And this makes a huge difference at, at the time of making a diagnosis, having all this information available. And the pathologist is the first member of the clinical team to have all the information available. Because before surgery and before, we, we're the first ones to, to get histology. Like other physicians will have access to information on the EMR, but we are the first ones to have access to histology, differentiation markers, and molecular signature. So this highlights the critical role of the pathologist in making a diagnosis for a patient that will impact treatment uh, um, prognosis. Now, the two of these uh, spheres are rapidly evolving. One is molecular signature determination and preoperative imaging. And these are changing very rapidly and these two fields are growing and, and expanding uh, significantly in the past few years and that will continue to happen uh, over the next few years. And it will have impact in, and, and change how we diagnose brain tumors. Imaging is, is pathology, that's true for all specialties, but even more so for, for brain tumors, because imaging is our gross examination. When you when you're, are examining a, a colon specimen, you can examine the uh, colectomy specimen grossly. However, uh, for brain tumors, the lesions often come out of the operating room fragmented. So the gross examination is the imaging. Imaging is pathology, and this is, this is very important for the diagnosis of CNS tumors. Now, I, I mentioned earlier uh, about the new WHO, uh, the fifth edition, which will be coming out. Initially, it was uh, supposed to come out in 2020, and this was postponed to 2021. Um, the first edition of the WHO was released in 1979, second edition in 93. Uh, third edition in 2000, the fourth edition in 2007, and we currently are working under the revised fourth edition in, released in 2016. And the main change between the 2007 classification and the 2016 classification was the incorporation of molecular alterations and defining features of CNS tumors. And in fact, it incorporation of molecular alterations as part of the name of uh, some of these entities. And this is a trend that's uh, in, uh, continuing in the 2021 edition. The, there's a working group, the CE Impact Now uh, working group has released seven updates, which outline the major changes coming in the fifth edition of the WHO classification system for CNS tumors, which initially was quoted to be WHO 2020, Will now be released in 2021. And these are these seven publications. Uh, C Impact Now Update 1, all the way through C Impact Now Update 7. And they're published in Acta Neuropathologica and Brain Pathology and, uh, in the past two years. Two of these uh, updates, uh, Update 5 and Update 6, deal with uh, diffuse gliomas. Uh, in particular, I'll be talking a little bit about that uh, in the next few slides. Fuse gliomas, we can basically separate them as adult type and pediatric type. And they will, of course, occur uh, in different age groups and they have different uh, genetic drivers. There are different molecular alterations that drive the adult type diffuse gliomas versus the pediatric type diffuse gliomas. And you'll be hearing about pediatric type diffuse gliomas in the next presentation by, by Dr. Velasquez. So let's focus on the adult type diffuse gliomas. Um, from WHO 2016, this uh, is a list of the different types of, of diffuse gliomas in adults, in diffuse astrocytomas, IDH mutant, the ratio grade two, uh, WHO grade three or glioblastoma IDH mutant WHO grade four. Then we have the IDH wild type counterpart, diffuse astrocytoma IDH wild type WHO grade two, diffuse anaplastic astrocytoma IDH wild type 
WHO grade three, and glioblastoma in the H wild type WHO grade four. It's also little than glioma, LDH mutant, 1P19Q codiluted, WHO grade two, and the anaplastic little than glioma, LDH mutant, 1P19Q codiluted, WHO grade three. Here we can see the incorporation of uh, genomic alterations, in this case, IDH mutation, and in the case of oligo, IDH mutation, and 1P19Q codiluted is part of the name. These are defining features for, for this entity. That means that in order to make a diagnosis of oligodendroglioma, we need to know the IDH status, and there has to be an IDH1 or an IDH2 mutation, and there has to be 1P19Q codiluted. Both are required for the diagnosis of oligodendroglioma, IDH mutant, 1P19Q codiluted. We have these terms that are outdated terms now, oligoastrocytoma and anaplastic oligoastrocytoma. The use of this is discouraged and uh, because uh, these are old nomenclature and the great majority of these lesions can be diagnosed as either oligodendroglioma or astrocytoma uh, by incorporating information from molecular alterations. In the next show, 2021, um, this is changed to astrocytomas, IDH mutant, grade two, grade three, and grade four. So the terms of diffuse astrocytoma for grade two and the term anaplastic astrocytoma for grade two is, is removed. So these are simply astrocytomas, IDH mutant, and the grade based on histologic features. And for the oligodendroglioma, IDH mutant, 1P19Q codiluted, grade two or grade three, and then glioblastomas, IDH wild type. Note that in the prior 2016 or in the current, the, the 2016 uh, edition, there was a an entity of glioblastoma IDH mutant. Now that is changed and the term glioblastoma is reserved for lesions that are IDH wild type. So there's no IDH mutant glioblastoma in the new uh, classification system. It would be an astrocytoma IDH mutant WHO grade four. And the reason for that is that these lesions behave different than glioblastomas, they're, they're different diseases. Um, even if there's vascular proliferation or necrosis, which are the histologic features that we associate with uh, glioblastomas, in the presence of an IDH mutation, th those tumors will behave better. So now glioblastoma is reserved for IDH wild type tumors. So let's take a look at an IDH mutant astrocytoma. This is a 25 year old female. The preoperative uh, MRI, here we can see the axial T2 sequence on the left showing T2 hyperintensity, the temporal lobe, the T2 flare uh, sequence in the center and an axial T1 with contrast on the right. And we see that there is no contrast enhancement in, in this lesion. So what would be the diagnosis for this based on the imaging? Well, we have a non-enhancing glioma in an adult patient that shows T2 flare mismatch. The T2 flare mismatch refers to this difference in intensity uh, in, in the, between the T2 sequence and the T2 flare sequence. There's a, there's a mismatch here and, and that's the T2 flare mismatch. Right? It's, it's less intense in the T2 flare than in the 2T sequence. And that's highly characteristic of IDH mutant diffuse astrocytic disease. So just from looking at the imaging, we can predict that this is going to be an IDH mutant astrocytoma. We haven't looked at the tissue, we haven't done any immunohistochemical markers, we haven't done any sequencing, and we already have a very, very precise diagnosis. How good is this T2 flare mismatch at predicting IDH mutations in, in diffuse glioma. Well, according to this paper, it's a highly specific imaging biomarker for IDH mutant 1P19Q non codiluted so 1P19Q intact, IDH mutant 1P19Q intact molecular subtype of gliomas. So that means astrocytomas because IDH mutant 1P19Q codiluted would be oligodendroglioma. It's highly specific for IDH mutant astrocytoma. And in this uh, study published in Neuro-Oncology, um, the positive predictive value was essentially 100% for, for the T2 flare mismatch sign. 
So it is very, very powerful. And here you can see eight different patients showing the T2 flare mismatch. And these are T2 flare sequences, and you can see how uh, they're, they're hypo intense uh, in the T2 flare in, in all of these cases. And these are all tissue proven IDH mutant diffuse astrocytomas, meaning tissue proven that uh, there was surgery, we examined the tissue, and uh, the presence of an IDH mutation was confirmed in all of these cases. And this just highlights the power of imaging uh, in the diagnosis of CNS tumors. This is a histology for this particular patient. You can see how there's hypercellularity uh, with some, we can consider mild pleomorphism. There are these cystic spaces, which are frequently seen in IDH mutant um, tumors. In this case had elevated mitotic activity. There was no vascular proliferation and there was no necrosis. So taking all the information that we have, this would be a WHO grade three. Based, based on histologic criteria because of the absence of vascular proliferation and necrosis, and it would be a grade three because of the elevated mitotic activity. There's no specific cutoff for mitosis. Uh, how, how many mitoses are needed for, for a grade three? There is no, no defined cutoff. So this would have been an anaplastic astrocytoma based on the 2016 WHO classification. Uh, this is the IDH1 R132H specific uh, antibody showing how there is diffuse staining of the tumor cells in these cases. In, th in this particular case, uh, we can see a higher magnification. You can see how the blood vessels, these are the endothelial cells in the blood vessels, they are negative for IDH1 R132H. So the blood vessels do not, do not have the mutation, only the tumor cells have uh, the, the mutant protein. And this is the results of P53. So there is uh, P53 expression in the majority of the cells. And you can see how there's strong P53 expression in the majority of these cells. And there is loss of ATRX. And you can see here in the center is a blood vessel showing retained nuclear expression of ATRX by the endothelial cells. And there are some normal cells in the background that retain normal nuclear ATRX expression. There are many cells that are uh, negative for, for ATRX. So there's loss of ATRX expression in the tumor cells. And that is indicative on, of an ATRX mutation. So the classic molecular alteration triad of the IDH mutant diffuse astrocytic disease is presence of an IDH1 or IDH2 mutation, a P53 mutation, and loss of ATRX expression. And these frequently happen uh, together. Uh, th these three alterations uh, coexist in IDH mutant uh, astrocytomas. And we can determine this by using immunohistochemistry, which is very powerful and it's faster and in many cases is uh, perhaps more easily accessible than advanced sequencing. Uh, tests. But IDH you know, immunohistochemistry is particular for IDH1. There's no antibody for IDH2 mutations yet. Um, TB53 antibodies and ATRX uh, antibodies are, are readily available. There's a, a study back in 2015, the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, that is comprehensive integrated genomic analysis of diffuse low, lower grade gliomas. So in particular, focusing on lower grade tumors. This is from the Cancer Genome Atlas, the, the TCGA. You can see that uh, diffuse grade two and grade three uh, gliomas, low grade gliomas, uh, what other alterations are present in these tumors? Uh, some cases have IDH mutation, 1P90 Q codeletion. These are oligodendrogliomas and they have frequently inactivated mutations in CIC, FUBP1, and NOTCH1. They have activated mutations in P3CA, third promoter, uh, and of course, IDH1, IDH2, 
in contrast, the IDH wild type tumors, which are uh, glioblastomas, um, they have alterations in e EGFR, MDM4. They have third, so third mutations are present in both, but note that IDH1, IDH2 mutations are present in malignant neurogliomas. They are not present in glioblastomas, IDH wild type. And glioblastomas frequently have EGFR and P10 alterations, and, and these are important and, and critical now for, for the diagnosis of glioblastomas, IDH wild type from a molecular from a molecular standpoint, because they're very common. And we have tumors that have an IDH mutation, but no 1P19Q codeletion. 1P19Q codeletion is absent, and these frequently have TP53 and ATRX mutations. This is the example that I just showed you, the IDH mutant, TP53 mutant, ATRX mutant glioma. These are diffuse astrocytomas, uh, IDH mutant. Uh, we've now uh, eliminated the, the term diffuse from the name, so this would be astrocytoma, IDH mutant, uh, grade 2, 3, or grade 4, based on, on histologic features. So uh, if we go back to our case under the 2016 WHO classification system, this 25-year-old patient, the diagnosis would be anaplastic astrocytoma, IDH mutant, WHO grade 3. Now, if we follow the C impact now updates five and, and six for uh, which deal with diffuse gliomas, this is uh, what the update uh, tells us essentially. In 2016, we had diffuse astrocytoma, plastic astrocytoma, grade three, and glioblastoma, grade four, uh, for IDH mutant tumors. In 2020, uh, the, the terminology is astrocytoma IDH mutant, grade two, astrocytoma IDH mutant, grade three, astrocytoma IDH mutant, grade, grade four. So you can see how the name has changed. The term glioblastoma is reserved for IDH wild type uh, diffuse astrocytoma, as I mentioned uh, earlier. So, what is an IDH mutant uh, astrocytoma grade two? It's an, uh, infiltrative astrocytic glioma with an IDH1 or IDH2 mutation, which lacks histologic features of anaplasia. So very low or no detectable mitotic activity, no vascular proliferation, no necrosis, and no homozygous deletion of CDKN2AB. That is an astrocytoma IDH mutant WHO grade two. An astrocytoma IDH mutant WHO grade three is also an infiltrative astrocytic glioma with an IDH1 or IDH2 mutation, which has focal or dispersed anaplasia uh, in, in the sense of significant mitotic activity. However, there is no vascular proliferation, no necrosis, and no homozygous deletion of CDKN2AV. And that's an anaplastic astrocyte, and uh, uh, that's an astrocytoma IDH mutant, WHO grade three. The astrocytoma IDH mutant, WHO grade four, it's also an infiltrative astrocytic glioma with an IDH1 or IDH2 mutation, but it has vascular proliferation or necrosis or homozygous deletion of CDKN2AB. And it means or homozygous deletion of CDKN2AB. So if there is an astrocytoma, it's an IDH mutation that doesn't show vascular proliferation and doesn't show necrosis, but it shows the presence of CDKN2AB homozygous deletion, it would be a grade four. So this is a molecular alteration defining uh, grade for, for astrocytomas IDH mutant because these tumors behave uh, poorly. The IDH mutant tumors in general behave uh, much better than other types of astrocytic gliomas. However, the ones that have CDKN2AB homozygous deletion uh, behave poorly. So they are given a WHO grade four, even in the absence of vascular proliferation or necrosis. So it is important to evaluate CDKN2AB uh, status for IDH mutant tumors because it has an impact on tumor behavior and, and tumor grade. So here we have our patient uh, in 2016. Anaplastic astrocytoma, IDH mutant, WHO grade three. In 2020, the diagnosis is astrocytoma, IDH mutant, WHO grade three. 
but we don't know CK into AB status for this patient. So it, it could be a WHO grade four, in fact, if, if there was a CK into AB homozygous deletion. Prognostic power of histologic grading in, in IDH mutant gliomas is something that remains under, under consideration. Uh, it's, it's still retained in, in the WHO uh, 2021. However, it's, it's the way things are going is going to be very difficult to accurately grade IDH mutant uh, lesions without knowing CDK and 2 ab status. We already mentioned this, astrocytomas, the uh, triad of molecular alterations, IDH1, IDH2, ATRXP53 mutations, oligodendrogliomas on the other hand, IDH1, IDH2 mutant, or 1P19Q codeleted. If we look at the IDH1 mutation, there's an antibody that uh, detects the IDH1 R132H. I show you an, uh, an image of that immunostain earlier. Uh, that particular uh, antibody, which recognizes the R132H mutant protein, uh, that mutation accounts for 93% or 94% of IDH mutant uh, gliomas. There are other IDH mutations, R132C, R132S, so serine, glycine, leucine, valine, or IDH2 mutations that are not detected by, by the antibody. So the antibody, it's helpful in more than 90% of cases, but is not entirely specific, so which is critical when we are uh, in, incorporating algorithms in clinical practice to evaluate IDH1 mutations. So we can use a combination of IDH1 and, and TRX uh, antibodies to simplify the classification of diffuse gliomas uh, in. The, the molecular classification of diffuse gliomas to a greater extent with the caveat that the IDH1 antibody uh, will miss some cases that have different IDH mutation, uh, different IDH1 mutation or IDH2 mutations. However, if you stack with these two antibodies, IDH1 and ATRX, if the glioma is uh, IDH mutant and shows retained expression of ATRX, so they're both positive, um, one pin TQ should be evaluated. If it's codeleted, the diagnosis will be oligodendroglioma, either grade two or grade three. If it's non-codeleted, the diagnosis will be astrocytoma, grade two, grade three, or uh, grade four. It will be astrocytoma grade four because it has an IDH mutation, and now we've changed this terminology for glioblastoma. There's no longer IDH mutant glioblastoma. So it will be astrocytoma grade four, IDH mutant. If there's an IDH mutation, so the IDH1 antibody is positive, but there's loss of uh, ATRX expression, so IDH mutant, ATRX mutant, there's no need to evaluate for 1P19Q codeletion because ATRX mutation and 1P19Q codeletion um, do not coexist. So they're mutually exclusive uh, for practical purposes. So the diagnosis will be astrocytoma IDH mutant, grade two, three, or four. If IDH1 uh, antibody is negative and ATRX uh, is intact, so it's positive, there's retained expression of ATRX, 1P19Q should be evaluated. If it's codeleted, then sequencing should be performed and the diagnosis would be oligodendroglioma, uh, IDH mutant, 1P19Q codeleted, if there's a, a, an IDH mutation. If uh, it's non codeleted, but it's uh, there's a mutation in IDH1 or IDH2 detected by sequencing. The diagnosis would be astrocytoma uh, IDH mutant. And then again, there's, there's no IDH mutant glioblastoma. So it would be astrocytoma grade two, grade three, or grade four. If there's no IDH mutation detected by sequencing, then the diagnosis would be uh, glioblastoma, most likely IDH uh, wild type. It could be astrocytoma grade two or grade three. However, for infiltrating gliomas uh, that are IDH wild type, uh, that 
majority of these lesions that are IDH wild type are, are glioblastoma. You should be very, very careful about making a diagnosis of astrocytoma, IDH wild type, WHO grade two, because most likely something is missing. Uh, and it could be a sampling issue where it looks like a low grade astrocytoma. And, and um, it, it's, a, it's a scenario that's uh, propense for, for misdiagnosis. It's low grade astrocytomas that are IDH wild type. You should be very careful about making, making that diagnosis. Now, there, there are uh, some things to consider when we're looking at uh, molecular alterations in diffuse gliomas, in particular in, in, in oligodendrogliomas. This is an article that we published back in 2017 in Human Pathology, Molecular Classification of All Diffuse Gliomas Conflicting, IDH1, IDH2, ATRX, and 1P19Q results. And um, there's some examples of cases where, where the results of the molecular evaluation um, provided us with conflicting uh, information that made the molecular classification of, of these infiltrating gliomas uh, difficult. Here we have six cases. Um, the histologic diagnosis is shown here. Most of them were glioblastomas. This was uh, anaplastic oligodendroglioma by histology high-grade diffuse glioma and anaplastic oligodendroglioma histologic grade, the IDH status. These three lesions were wild type, so these three were glioblastomas. This was mutant, IDH mutant, um, and these were wild types. So only one of these lesions was had an IDH mutation, which was called anaplastic oligodendroglioma on histology. Now, when we look at ATRX, uh, there was is positive, so retain expression of ATRX, retain expression of ATRX. Here there was ATRX loss. Um, and this uh, patient number four had an IDH mutation and ATRX loss. So this is just like the example uh, that I uh, provided earlier with uh, these two alterations coexisting. So this is an astrocytoma IDH mutant. That would be the classic molecular alteration. Uh, because of loss of ATRX, um, the diagnosis of oligodendroglioma is uh, unlikely, in, in fact, in this particular case. And, and this diagnosis made on histology of anaplastic oligodendroglioma is uh, incorrect. Even in the setting of 1P19Q codeletion by, by fish. And I'll be explaining this a little bit why all of these cases show 1P19Q codeletion. However, all of these cases are not oligodendrogliomas. In fact, um, none of these cases are oligodendrogliomas, even though all of them showed 1P19Q codeletion. And, and the problem is that about 5% of glioblastomas show 1P19Q codeletion when examined by fish. And the reason for that is if you look at the probes, uh, uh, for 1P in relationship to the size of the chromosome, right? The 1P arm or the 1Q arm, the probes bind to a very small region of the chromosome. And that's true for the probes that bind to chromosome one or the probes that bind to chromosome 19. And there are small deletions or partial deletions that may interfere with probe binding, but are not the defining molecular alteration of oligodendroglioma. So the defining molecular alteration of oligodendroglioma is complete loss of the 1P arm and complete loss of the 19Q arm. So the entire 19Q and the entire 1P arm are lost. And we use these probes that bind to a small region of, of, the, of the 1P arm or the 90 arm to detect this complete loss. However, there can be a partial loss or a small deletion in the chromosome that prevents the probe from binding. So you will get the same result as when the entire 1P arm is lost. 
And that happens in about 5% of glioblastomas. And that's why 1P19Q coagulation by fish alone is not sufficient for an accurate diagnosis of oligodendroglioma. Now, when combined with the presence of an IDH mutation, then that becomes uh, very powerful. And it correlates with the uh, better behavior uh, and better prognosis of uh, oligodendrogliomas. Now I'm going to briefly present you another example of uh, incorporation of imaging and molecular alterations in the diagnosis of uh, gliomas. This is a 49 year old female patient. And you can see here T2 on the left, T2 flare on the middle and T1 with contrast. And you can see the resolution uh, here that doesn't show contrast enhancement in this 49 year old patient. So T2 flare hyper intensity mm -hmm. without contrast enhancement. It's non enhancing. And there's no T2 flare mismatch uh, as opposed to the prior patient, the 25 year old patient that I show you, which had T2 flare mismatch, this patient doesn't show that. Uh, magnetic resonance spectroscopy, you can see here, if we look at this uh, region, there's normal brain uh, showing a normal uh, angle uh, here. If we focus on the lesion, there is an inverted hunter's angle where the, uh, uh, with an elevated choline creatinine ratio and uh, elevated choline NAA. Uh, ratio. So this would be the uh, signature on MR spectroscopy. Uh, it's consistent with the tumor as opposed to a uh, normal brain here. Uh, so this is densely cellular lesion, likely anaplastic, uh, at least WHO grade three lesion, just based on these imaging uh, characteristics. Here we have an H&E uh, showing hypercellularity, pleomorphism, uh, PHH3, which is a phosphorylated histone antibody that we can use to highlight mitosis. There's mitosis here, there, and there. So we have mitotic activity and uh, increased Ki67 proliferation uh, shown here as well. So astrocytic morphology, no microvascular proliferation, no necrosis, no enhancement on the MRI. Um, this would be an anaplastic astrocytoma WHO grade three based on the 2016 WHO classification system. Now we do molecular signature determination. We use an antibody against the mutant histone protein, H3K27M is negative. Um, so the trimethylation is, is preserved. This uh, antibody recognizes the lysine 27, same lysine 27 that is normally trimethylated. So under wild type normal circumstances, uh, this uh, lysine 27 is trimethylated and this antibody recognizes that. Uh, when the mutation is present, um, the trimethylation at lysine 27 is lost. So these cells would be negative. However, this, there's no mutation. There is preserved uh, trimethylation of lysine 27. There's intact ATRX expression. So no mutations in ATRX. And there is uh, essentially a very few cells are labeling with the P53. So this would be a P53 wild type case uh, as opposed to the prior example. And you can see that here, retain uh, K27 trimethylation, no H3K27M mutation, no ATRX mutation, and no P53 mutation. We did next generation sequencing in this case, and these are the genes that are uh, evaluated. All the genes that are listed here were evaluated in this case. The ones that are circled in red uh, showed a uh, mutation. Uh, Ter promoter uh, mutation, MDM2, EGFR mutation, CDK2, CDK4 mutation. We focus on third. Uh, this is a uh, minus 124. So minus indicates that it's before the ATG, before the start codon. So this is in the promoter of third, so third promoter mutation, uh, which is well known to happen in uh, glioblastomas. EGFR, we have EGFR amplification. Uh, EGFR is in chromosome seven. So the diagnosis in 2016 would be anaplastic astrocytoma, WHO grade three. However, 
under the current uh, classification system for the new WHO that will be coming out in 2021. This would be a glioblastoma IDH wild type WHO grade four. Even in the absence of necrosis, even in the absence of vascular proliferation, uh, this would still be a WHO grade four tumor because of the molecular alterations. Uh, type promoter mutation, EGFR amplification are classic alterations of glioblastoma. And that's uh, highlighted in the C impact now update uh, six. So what is the criteria for glioblastoma IDH wild type? So an IDH wild type diffuse astrocytoma with microvascular proliferation or necrosis or one or more of the following molecular alterations. Either a third promoter mutation would be sufficient to make a diagnosis of glioblastoma, even in the absence of vascular proliferation or necrosis, or EGFR amplification uh, would be sufficient to make a diagnosis of glioblastoma, even in the absence of vascular proliferation or necrosis, or combined gain of chromosome seven and loss of chromosome 10. So any of these three molecular alterations is sufficient to make a diagnosis of glioblastoma in, in the appropriate clinical setting of an infiltrating glioma, uh, even without vascular proliferation or necrosis. So there is a change here, it's a fundamental change where molecular alterations um, are used as evident, evidence to support the diagnosis of, of glioblastoma, even in the absence of the traditional histologic features that have been associated with glioblastoma for, for uh, for many, many years in the past. And this case had both of them. Only one is sufficient, but this particular example had both terpomotor mutation and EGFR amplification. So this non-enhancing grade three IDH Walter astrocytoma would have been uh, based on classic histologic features. Uh, under 2016, it would have been an anaplastic astrocytoma IDH Walter WHO grade three. That would have been the diagnosis. Uh, under the current 2016 WHO classification system. However, 2020 uh, WHO or 2021 WHO, the diagnosis is glioblastoma, IDH wild type WHO grade four because of the molecular alterations. So this is a summary of uh, the adult diffuse astrocytic disease in 2021, um, IDH wild type tumors, glioblastomas, uh, vascular proliferation or necrosis or one of these three molecular alterations. And we have the IDH mutant uh, astrocytomas, uh, which are now astrocytoma, IDH mutant grade two, astrocytoma, IDH mutant grade three, astrocytoma, IDH mutant grade four. And the presence or absence of CDK in 2AB homocycle deletion is critical uh, for grading the IDH mutant astrocytomas. Uh, this is an image of the Texas Medical Center. Uh, here is uh, where we are located, and I'll be happy to take uh, any questions. Hello, my name is Leo Ballester, and I'm an assistant professor in molecular pathology and neuropathology at the University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston. Um, I will be talking about the use of CSF biomarkers for the diagnosis and monitoring of patients with CNS malignancies. So the tools that are currently available for the diagnosis and uh, monitoring of patients with CNS malignancies are useful, but there's room for improvement. For example, imaging has limited specificity. We are able to easily identify lesions on the MRI, but it's not necessarily so easy to uh, say with 100% specificity what type of lesion uh, it is. Um, CSF cytology which has limited sensitivity. Uh, so CSF cytology is negative, even in the presence of uh, obvious uh, CNS tumor and biopsy or resection, which is sensitive and specific, but it is an invasive procedure. 
So this is an example of uh, two MRIs. There's a patient with uh, glioblastoma at the top, and there's a patient with CNS lymphoma at the bottom. You can see how the lesions are similar on the T1 sequence. There's this T1 hypointense region, uh, there's T2 flare hyperintensity, and both lesions show contrast enhancement. Um, and in some cases, it can be difficult to distinguish uh, between glioblastoma and central nervous system lymphoma on MRI alone. Also in the post-treatment setting, uh, there's this uh, phenomenon called pseudo progression or, or treatment effect where the imaging changes that occur as a result of treatment can mimic uh, glioblastoma, for example, and it can become uh, it can be very challenging to distinguish uh, what is treatment associated changes on the imaging versus uh, tumor recurrence. And in some cases, the patients undergo a second surgery because we are not able to distinguish uh, pseudo progression uh, or, or treatment effects from true progression or tumor recurrence. Um, in the case of uh, CSF cytology or the analysis of circulating tumor cells in, in the CSF. This has very low sensitivity. And you can see an example here of the CSF cytology specimen. There are many lymphocytes in the background. There are some larger cells that can be considered atypical cells. Um, and uh, it, it can be difficult in some cases to uh, be certain as to whether this uh, cell represents a tumor cell or represents reactive atypia. And in, in some other cases, we have obvious clusters of tumor cells present in the CSF, and this will be uh, positive for, for tumor. This is an example of medulloblastoma. So this suffers from low sensitivity. Um, it, it is negative, so frequently we are not able to detect viable intact tumor cells in the CSF of patients with brain tumors. It suffers from interobserver variability because some pathologists may consider this a neoplastic cell and another pathologist might consider it a reactive uh, cell. And it also doesn't provide information about the mutations that are present in the tumor, which is something that is becoming uh, more and more important in the diagnosis of CNS malignancies. So we did a study and we look at 142 patients with a primary or metastatic CNS tumor. In our institution, there are 218 cerebrospinal fluid samples. Um, many of the patients had CNS metastases, and all of the patients was, were positive uh, for a lesion uh, on the MRI. And only 24% uh, of the patients showed a positive CSF cytology result. In the case of primary CNS tumor, the percentage was uh, much lower. Uh, all the patients were positive for a uh, mass lesion by MRI, and only one out of 108, so less than 1%, uh, were positive for, for CSF cytology. So this has a very low sensitivity, uh, especially in the setting of primary CNS tumors. And brain biopsies, this is an example of a resection. Uh, our, our, sensitive and uh, they're specific. They accomplish uh, also, they, they have a treatment purpose. They, they accomplish cytoreduction where we can reduce the number of uh, neoplastic cells in, in the brain. It provides tissue for examination by histology or by molecular studies, but it's an invasive procedure and not every CNS tumor is treated with surgery. And even in the setting of these CNS lesions uh, or CNS malignancies that are not treated, by surgery like lymphomas, uh, the patients still undergo a brain biopsy so that we can obtain tissue and examine the tissue and, and make a diagnosis. So not every patient with a brain uh, tumor needs surgery. So how can we improve the diagnosis and the monitoring of patients with CNS tumors? Well, we, we know this concept of cell-free DNA or, or circulating tumor DNA. And uh, cell-free DNA refers to DNA that is circulating freely in body fluids as a result of cell death. Uh, by either apoptosis or necrosis, the cells die, uh, 
they release DNA fragments into uh, the fluid or, or into the blood. And uh, we can detect these, these fragments. If, if the DNA comes from a normal cell, uh, it will be wild type DNA. If these DNA fragments come from a tumor cell, it would be tumor DNA. So in, in fluids, we often see a mixture of tumor DNA and normal DNA. And this is uh, being used uh, with increasing frequently in the diagnosis and, and monitoring of patients with systemic malignancies like lung cancer, colon cancer, uh, in particular, looking at circulating tumor DNA in, in the blood. And the analysis of circulating tumor DNA facilitates the detection of cancer associated mutations from body fluids. And fluid samples are easier to collect than tissue samples. And fluid samples are also amenable to serial collection at multiple time points during the course of a patient's illness, which is something that's difficult to do uh, with tissue, especially when the tissue in question is uh, brain tissue. Right? It would be very difficult to submit a patient to uh, serial brain biopsies and, and doing multiple brain biopsies over time is it, something that uh, would be very difficult to do, but uh, fluid samples uh, are easier to collect uh, over time. So can we detect circulating tumor DNA in the plasma of patients with central nervous system malignancies? So here's a study that look at detection of circulating tumor DNA in the plasma of uh, patients with different tumor types. And you can see the tumor type here, bladder cancer, colorectal cancer, gastric. And in a large percentage of these uh, patients, uh, they were able to detect circulating tumor DNA in the plasma. If you look at gliomas, which are down here at the bottom, they were able to detect circulating tumor DNA in the plasma only in a very small percentage of patients. And if you look at the amount of circulating tumor DNA that was present, uh, it was also very, very low in, in the setting of gliomas, for example. So it is possible to detect circulating tumor DNA in the plasma of some patients with gliomas, but this is possible in only a very small number of patients and the amount of tumor DNA that is detected is, is very small. So this is a suboptimal approach for, for brain tumors. Now, this is a different study that looked at 20 patients with newly diagnosed glioblastoma. And they examined uh, tumor tissue and matching plasma from the same patients and they performed next generation sequencing, evaluating for mutations in 152 genes. Um, they look at uh, cell-free DNA concentration in healthy donors and in patients with glioblastoma, and they saw that there was a trend toward higher levels of cell-free DNA in the plasma of patients that had glioblastoma. However, when they look at the mutations in tissue and plasma, and you can see the mutations here uh, from uh, the tumor tissue are shown in blue, the mutations uh, detected in plasma are shown in red, and these are the different patients there was uh, no concordance between the mutations that were detected in plasma ctDNA and the mutations that were detected in uh, brain tumor tissue. So basically this, this, uh, this raises questions as to the utility of this approach of uh, looking at plasma cell-free DNA in patients with brain tumors, because none of the mutations in plasma cell-free DNA were present in the tumor tissue, and none of the mutations in the tumor tissue were detected in plasma. So there was, there was no concordance. And these are results from a different study where they look at the, the presence of the IDH1 mutation in the plasma of patients with gliomas. And they use this approach of uh, cold PCR uh, followed by digital PCR uh, in particular, they were looking for the IDH1 R132H mutation, which is uh, frequent in low-grade gliomas. And they uh, look at plasma of 14 patients with IDH1 type gliomas. You would expect these patients to be negative for the presence of the mutation, and 25 patients that had uh, IDH mutant gliomas. And they were able to detect the IDH mutation in the plasma of 15 out of these 25 patients, so 60% of patients. Uh, by, by looking at digital PCR, right, for this particular mutation. You can see the mutant of the frequency in the wild type patients here, uh, it's essentially negative. And then in patients that had IDH1 uh, mutant tumors, they were able to detect uh, 
mutant DNA in, in the plasma uh, of these patients. And this uh, is your an area under the curve of uh, 0.75. So ctDNA can be detected in the plasma of patients with central nervous system malignancies. But if, if you use next generation sequencing, this can be detected uh, only in small amounts. The, the amount of tumor DNA is very small in a small percentage of patients. And it has poor concordance with the mutations that are present in tumor tissue. If you use a different approach like digital PCR, which uh, it provides improved sensitivity in comparison to NGS, has better concordance or good concordance with tumor tissue. But digital PCR is limited to the analysis of a single point mutation in, in a single gene. So it's not something that's amenable to evaluating multiple genes in plasma uh, by next generation sequencing like can be done for lung cancer or colon cancer. And this approach for brain tumors is suboptimal. So can we use a different fluid? Can we detect circulating tumor DNA in the cerebrospinal fluid of patients with CNS malignancies? And the idea is that the patient has a brain tumor and as the tumor cells die, they release fragments of the tumor DNA into the CSF. And then you can take a CSF sample and analyze uh, the analyze the CSF for the presence of circulating tumor DNA. You can acquire CSF via lumbar puncture or via Nomaya reservoir. And this is a schematic of, of, of an example of how this could potentially be done. A person has a brain lesion, you obtain cerebrospinal fluid. Cerebrospinal fluid is a centrifuge to uh, pellet the cells and the cells can be examined by CSF cytology. And then the supernatant, which is usually discarded on, in, in most instances, you could extract cell-free DNA or the circulating tumor DNA from the CSF supernatant and analyze it for the presence of mutations by either next generation sequencing or, or using digital PCR. Here is an example of, of a study that uh, we published back in 2018 we use both digital PCR and next generation sequencing to detect C, uh, CSF ctDNA in patients with metastatic melanoma to the, to the central nervous system. Um, here's an example of a digital uh, PCR. We see we're essentially looking at, at droplets that uh, contain either wild type DNA fragments or tumor DNA fragments. And in, in a control with no template, all the droplets are, are double negative. So essentially there's no, no DNA. So this is what you would expect. When we look at the CSF supernatant from uh, this patient with metastatic melanoma to the brain, we are able to detect wild type DNA, these green droplets here. We're able to detect also uh, mutant DNA uh, in particular, the BRAF B600E mutation, which is very common in uh, melanoma. So we were able to detect the presence of circulating tumor DNA in the CSF uh, of, of this patient by digital PCR. Similarly, by next generation sequencing, uh, the skin tumor lesion show the presence of the BRAF B600E mutation. You can see it here in this uh, IGB plot. The brain metastasis tissue show the same mutation, VRAF B600E, and the CSF ctDNA uh, also show the presence of the VRAF B600E mutation. So it is possible to use either next generation sequencing or digital PCR to detect mutations in the CSF of patients with uh, brain tumor. And there is good concordance with the mutations uh, present in the tumor tissue. And is another study by a group from Memorial Sloan Catering. They detect mutations in CSF ctDNA in patients with metastasis and primary brain tumors. And they looked at 53 patients and they used a next generation sequencing assay that looked at 341 genes. So they sequenced 341 genes. And they detected mutations in CSF ctDNA in about half the patients, 49% so of the patients. You can see here that patients that had no CNS metastasis, so controls, there's no, no false positives. So no mutations are detected in the CSF. In about six of 12 patients with primary uh, brain tumor, they detected uh, mutations in, in circulating tumor DNA. 
and in about 20 out of 32 patients with CNS metastases. If we look at the patients with CNS metastases that were evaluated by cytology, CSF cytology, all the patients that were positive for CSF cytology, so there were two more cells detected in the CSF, they were able to detect mutations in, in the DNA isolated from the CSF supernatant. Now, even in cases where CSF cytology was negative, in about 25% of patients in which CSF cytology was negative, they're still able to detect tumor DNA uh, in, in the CSF. So the analysis of circulating tumor DNA in the CSF is more sensitive than uh, the analysis of uh, CSF cytology. Well, and I, I've been talking about the analysis of cell-free DNA. And when you're looking at CSF and you uh, centrifuge the CSF, and you, you could generate the CSF pellet, which is usually used for examination of uh, tumor cells. And you have the CSF supernatant. And the CSF supernatant contains DNA fragments that can be isolated and studied. What's the advantage of using the supernatant versus the pellet? Well, if you look at the how much uh, tumor DNA, which can be uh, examined by looking at the mutant allele frequency, what is the frequency of the mutant allele in the pellet versus the frequency of the mutant allele in the supernatant in the same patient, this patient had a BRAP B6 under the mutation, you can see that the CSF pellet has very low mutant allele frequency versus the CSF supernatant has much higher frequency of uh, mutant DNA. And here are some controls where no mutations were detected. And what happens is that in the CSF pellet, if we look at, the, at a CSF sample, for example, and we centrifuge this sample, the cell pellet is going to contain a lot of normal cells, primarily a lot of normal lymphocytes that do not have the mutation. These are non, most of the cells that are present in CSF are non-neoplastic cells. And the presence of all these neoplastic cells, that of these non-neoplastic cells that are present in the CSF pellet contribute wild type DNA. So you're essentially diluting the DNA that uh, is present in the rare viable tumor cells that are present in the CSF pellet. However, the CSF supernatant will contain all the DNA fragments that were released from uh, these viable cells uh, and the presence, the, the frequency of the mutant DNA is uh, the mutant allele frequency is significantly higher than, than in the pellet. This is an, an uncomprint of CSF uh, CTDNA mutations in patients with glioma. And then again, this is a different story, but they also were able to detect mutations in CSF in about half of the patients. They were not. Uh, no mutations detected in any of the control samples. And five of the 42 patients showed DNA hypermutation or high tumor burden, which is something that uh, can be can occur after uh, treatment with tebosolamide and could have uh, therapeutic implications, this hypermutation phenotype. So this is possible to also detect the hypermutation phenotype by looking at CSF ctDNA. So they analyzed the plasma of 19 patients that were positive for CSF ctDNA and detected mutations only in three out of these 19 patients. And basically one of these three patients developed metastatic GBM. So one of these three patients is actually an, an, an outlier because metastatic glioblastoma is extremely rare. Basically all these patients were 19 patients. They were able to detect mutations in the CSF. They look at the plasma they were only able to detect mutations in the plasma of three out of these patients where mutations were detected in the CSF. So it, it again highlights that CSF is superior to plasma for evaluation of mutations in patients with CNS malignancies. Uh, there is a correlation between uh, CSF ctDNA and, and survival. Uh, in, in this study also they compare match uh, tumor tissue and, and CSF. You can see the mutations that were shared between tumor tissue and the CSF-CTDNA are shown in red. 
So most of the mutations were shown in both. There's good concordance between mutations in brain tumor tissue and CSFCT DNA, uh, as opposed to uh, the mutations that are detected in plasma, where, where there's poor concordance um, with tumor tissue. Uh, there was only a few discrepancies where some mutations were present in CSF that were not identified in tumor tissue. And this could be uh, the result of tumor heterogeneity in, in some of the samples. Now, there's also a correlation with, concor uh, with survival. Uh, patients that were negative for CSF CTDNA analysis, so no mutations were detected, these patients lived longer than patients that had a positive CSF CTDNA uh, result where mutations were detected, and these patients show worse survival. So there's a clinical significance of detecting mutations in CSF, in CSF CTDNA in patients with uh, gliomas. Here we have uh, patients with glioblastoma on the left and patients with lung cancer brain metastasis on the right. If you look at this patient with glioblastoma. They looked at the presence of mutations in the CSF in the plasma, and uh, they evaluated the uh, tumor burden by volumetric analysis of uh, brain MRIs. You can see how they're looking at two different time points. And this patient, uh, they're looking at three different mutations, the IDH mutation in blue, the TP53 mutation in red, and an ANK2 mutation in green. And the patient essentially had uh, stable levels of uh, mutant DNA in the CSF. There were no detectable levels in plasma. and had stable uh, tumor burden at both time points. This other patient that also had glioblastoma, there was a decrease in the levels of uh, circulating tumor DNA in the CSF between the first time point and the second time point. Again, non-detectable levels in plasma and the brain tumor burden uh, also decreased. So there's a correlation between the amount of uh, uh, the tumor burden uh, as evaluated by MRI goes uh, down over time with uh, the CSF CTDNA levels that also go down over time. So uh, this suggests that the levels of CSF CTDNA can be used to monitor tumor burden. Uh, similarly, in these patients with lung cancer brain metastasis, we have one patient uh, on the left where the CSF uh, CTDNA levels decreased over time. Uh, plasma levels of uh, CTDNA actually increased for this particular mutation, which could be consistent with progressive uh, systemic disease. However, the uh, brain tumor burden was decreasing over time and the CSF CTDNA reflected that as well. So even in the setting of potentially a progressive systemic disease shown by the increase in uh, mutant DNA in plasma, the levels of CSF CTDNA correlated with the decrease in brain tumor burden evaluated by MRI. Similarly, for, for this patient, there was a decrease in CSF CTDNA that correlated with uh, a reduction in brain tumor burden. So the levels of CSF CTDNA could potentially be used to monitor uh, brain tumor burden over time perhaps with greater sensitivity than uh, imaging modalities. CSF uh, is superior to plasma for, for the analysis of circulating tumor DNA in, in patients with brain tumors. And, and I've given you a couple of examples of that. Here we have three additional uh, examples in, in this a uh, patient with a meningioma, the, the, it's an atypical meningioma having an AKT mutation, they were able to detect uh, the AKT mutation in uh, tumor tissue. The same mutation was detected in the CSF, but not in plasma. Uh, similarly, uh, in this particular study, they look at patients that had uh, both systemic uh, tumor and non-systemic uh, tumor. So they had CNS metastasis and uh, systemic disease, and they were able to detect mutations in both in the plasma and CSF uh, CTDNA. So the plasma CTDNA is reflective of the uh, non-CNS disease in, in this case. But patients that had only restricted uh, central nervous system disease, there's no detectable levels of circulating tumor DNA in the plasma. However, the tumor DNA was detected in, in CSF. Then again, highlighting this concept that 
analysis of plasma ctDNA is not ideal for patients with brain tumors. Uh, this other study looked at uh, digital PCR for the H3K27N mutation, which is frequently seen in diffuse midline gliomas. The CSF was positive in 20 out of 23 patients. And uh, the plasma was positive in uh, 18 out of these 20 patients, but the level of uh, mutant DNA that was detected in the plasma was very low. Then the mutant allele frequency was in the range of uh, zero to 2% versus the level, uh, the mutant allele frequency in CSF was much higher up to 40%. So there are much higher levels of mutant DNA in, in the CSF than there in plasma, which is what accounts for this uh, lack of sensitivity of next generation sequencing for detecting mutations in the plasma ctDNA of patients with brain tumors. Now with a more sensitive technique like digital PCR, you can detect the mutations in the plasma in some patients, but you're limited to a particular, to a single gene, in this case, to a single mutation, the H3K27M mutation. Uh, you cannot evaluate 341 genes uh, in the plasma because the sensitivity of this approach is much lower. So in summary, it is possible to detect circulating tumor DNA in the plasma of some patients with CNS tumors, mainly by digital PCR. This has low mutant allele frequency, poor sensitivity, and in the setting of next generation sequencing, there's poor concordance with the mutations that are present in the tumor tissue. Now, it is possible to detect circulating tumor DNA in the CSF of patients with CNS tumors by either next generation sequencing or by digital PCR. CSF has higher mutant allele fraction, has higher sensitivity, and it has great concordance with the mutations that are present in tumor tissue. So CSF is superior to plasma for the evaluation of circulating tumor DNA in patients with brain tumors. CSF supernatant is superior to the CSF pellet. And it is possible to monitor CSF ctDNA levels over time and the levels of ctDNA correlate with CNS tumor burden. So how can we use this in clinical practice? Well, there's some CNS malignancies that are not treated by surgical resection, and patients could benefit from CSF ctDNA analysis. And I will give you two examples. I'll give you an example of central nervous system lymphoma, and I'll give you an example of brainstem gliomas. Um, so, primary central nervous system lymphomas. Uh, the most common is diffuse large B cell lymphoma, which is confined to the CNS at presentation. It's about 3% of all CNS tumors, about 5% of external lymphomas, mainly uh, or most commonly occur in the supratentorial uh, region, uh, most commonly a single lesion, and there can be ocular involvement. And you can see that this frequently, uh, uh, more frequently occurs in older patients, 60s and uh, 70 years of age. The current management uh, for patients with CNS, uh, CNS malignancies it goes something like this. Their patient presents to the emergency room with symptoms. They perform an MRI. The imaging findings are suspicious for lymphoma. Uh, the patient may have CSF analysis to do flow cytometry or CSF cytology, which have limited sensitivity. The patient may undergo a brain biopsy to uh, look at histology of the brain tissue and using immunohistochemistry, and you can frequently arrive at a diagnosis of primary central nervous system lymphoma or, or central nervous system lymphoma. The patients get treated with high dose methotrexate, at least at our institution, this is the treatment that they receive. Here we have a brain biopsy showing a high degree of cellularity in the tissue. You can see that the cells are very large and, and pleomorphic. So this would be diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, which is just usually a significant amount of necrosis. And the lymphoma cells cluster around blood vessels. There's this perivascular distribution of these large atypical uh, cells, which is the classic histologic presentation of CNS lymphoma. You can do immunohistochemistry to CD20, which is uh, shows a membrane staining or PAX5, which shows a nuclear staining, also a B cell marker. CD10 is usually negative in primary CNS lymphomas. Uh, CD10 is usually uh, more, more likely to be positive in systemic uh, CNS lymphomas or, or secondary uh, involvement of the central nervous system by, by a systemic lymphoma. So those secondary lymphomas tend to be CD10 positive. 
Now, brain biopsy is not the only method for diagnosing CNS lymphoma. Uh, we've, uh, in some instances, have used PCR from CSF, in particular PCR for the Epstein-Barr virus in the diagnosis of primary CNS lymphoma, in particular in immunocompromised patients, right? And there are several studies that have shown this where viral sequences are detected in CSF, about 87.5% of patients with uh, uh, CNS lymphoma in the setting of immunosuppression and zero out of 32 control patients. So it's a very specific uh, technique. And in this other study, the EBV DNA was detected by PCR in the CSF of 90% of patients with HIV associated primary CNS lymphoma. So there are examples where we use molecular techniques from CSF to diagnose lymphomas, in particular in the setting of uh, patients that are uh, immunosuppressed. Now, this is an approach that has not been widely utilized for lymphomas that are, uh, that are occurring outside the setting of immunosuppression. And the reason for that is that uh, until, until recently, there have been no good markers to detect by PCR in the CSF, but that's changing now that we have a greater understanding of the molecular alterations of primary CNS lymphomas. Uh, there are also examples of using the complementary determining region three in the CSF of patients with primary CNS lymphoma. And in this particular study, they were able to detect a monoclonal uh, complementary determining region B in, in nine out of these patients. So it is possible it has a low sensitivity. Uh, no. So EBV PCR is limited because it only applies to patients with EBV driven lymphomas. This, the detection of CD3 clonality uh, showed a monoclonal population in only 13% of cases. So even though we can use PCR to diagnose lymphoma in, uh, in some cases, uh, using PCR from uh, in cerebrospinal fluid, it, it's limited and it doesn't have broad applicability to the majority of patients with CNS lymphoma. So can we apply this strategy to CSF analysis to other patients with lymphoma arising in a different setting by taking advantage of the increased understanding of the genomic alterations in primary CNS lymphoma. And that then raises the questions, what are those alterations? What are the alterations in primary CNS lymphoma? So we've uh, looked at this. This is a study looking at 15 patients with primary CNS lymphoma. Uh, they were evaluated with the next generation sequencing assay looking at 400 genes. And uh, the most common genomic alterations, the most commonly mutated genes were AMYD88 and CDKN2AB. Here's a different study looking at 25 patients with primary CNS lymphoma. Uh, they use different next generation sequencing assay, looking at 34 genes. And then again, the most commonly mutated genes were AMYD88 and CDKN2AB. Here's a third study looking at 22 patients and next generation sequencing assay interrogating 64 genes. And again, MYD88 was in this particular, in this case was the second most commonly mutated gene. So there several studies supporting that MYD88 is frequently mutated in primary CNS lymphoma. And if you look at this, um, all the studies that have been published, uh, these are the three most commonly mutated genes, MYD88, P1, and CD79A, uh, consistently mutated in uh, primary CNS lymphoma. In particular, this L265P mutation in the MYD88 gene is present uh, in the majority of primary CNS lymphomas that are not driven by EBV. So lymphomas that occur uh, in patients that are not immunosuppressed. Now, before we talk about MYD88, let's take a look at BRAF P600E mutation. If we look at the BRAF gene, which is shown here, and you look at thousands of cancer samples, 54,000 uh, cancer samples, the mutations in the BRAF gene that occur in cancer are almost always at this location, the colon 600. So the BRAF B600E is the most frequently, uh, the most frequent mutation in BRAF in cancer. Now, this mutation is not specific. You see it in many different types of cancer. You see it in thyroid cancer, in skin cancer, in melanoma, in intestine, in colon cancer. It's seen in, in many different types of cancer. So 
if we take a CSF sample and we find a BRFP600 mutation, it will not be diagnostic of a particular cancer type, right? Because it's not specific. It, it's seen in many different types of cancer. Now, if we look at MYD88, uh, we have the MYD88 here. We look at in this particular 2000 cancer cases. The mutations are similar to BRF, there, there's a hotspot at position 265. So the, when MYD88 is mutated in cancer, it's almost always mutated at this position. It's this losing uh, to proline mutation at column 265. Now, if you look, which cancers have this mutation, MYD88 L265P, it's almost exclusively in hematologic malignancies. So the MYD88 mutations occur almost exclusively in hematologic malignancies. They're very frequent, or almost all patients with Waldenstrom macroglobulinemia have this mutation, testicular lymphomas, and primary central nervous system lymphomas. So identifying the MYD88 L265P mutation in CSF, right, in combination with imaging and other clinical information, is essentially diagnostic of a hematologic malignancy. And it, the mutation is not specific for primary CNS lymphoma. It's also present in testicular lymphomas or Wollenstrom macroglobulinemia. But, but it's easy to distinguish this scenario uh, by clinical information. The, the clinical presentation, the clinical question is not usually whether the patient has a primary CNS lymphoma or Wollenstrom macroglobulinemia, or whether if the patient has primary CNS lymphoma or testicular lymphoma. Testicular lymphoma is present with testicular mass, so it's easy to identify this setting. The question is usually whether the patient has a primary CNS lymphoma or a glioblastoma, or if the patient has primary CNS lymphoma or a demyelinating disease. And in that clinical scenario, identifying the MYD88 L265P mutation in CSF is essentially diagnostic of lymphoma. So can we detect this mutation in CSF ctDNA in, the, in patients with, with lymphoma? Here's an example. You can see the MRI lesion of this patient, the brain biopsy confirmed the involvement by uh, diffuse large B cell lymphoma, CD20 CD positive cells, PAX5 positive cells. Right, these are both B cell markers. We look at the tumor tissue, show the MYD88 L265P uh, mutation by digital PCR. Same mutation was detected in the CSF. This other uh, mutation in the same gene, uh, B216F, the tissue was negative and the CSF was negative, the template control was negative. So we're able to detect the C uh, MYD88 L265P mutation in the CSF of this patient with uh, lymphoma. This particular patient had actually secondary central nervous system lymphoma, secondary involvement from a testicular lymphoma that was involved in the uh, central nervous system. So here's another example also uh, from a different group showing the uh, brain biopsy with CD20 positive cells, lymphoma, CSF cytology in this case was negative. It showed small lymphocyte without features suggestive of lymphoma. And then again, CSF cytology has a very low sensitivity. So this is not surprising. Uh, next generation sequencing analysis of the tumor tissue showed the MYD88 L265P mutation and the same mutation was detected in the CSF. Here's another study where they uh, looked at MYD88 L265P in CSF ctDNA, and they were able to detect it in 71% of patients, 10 out of 14 patients with primary CNS lymphoma, and none of the controls, so it's very specific, and it has a high sensitivity, so 71% percent of patients. And if you look at these three patients here, for example, they did CSF cytology was negative. And CSF flow cytometry was also negative. However, um, CSF ctDNA analysis, the MYD88 L265P mutation was detected in, in the CSF. Again, highlighting that this approach is more sensitive than CSF cytology or flow cytometry. Now, I mentioned earlier that the MYD88 L265P mutation is common in Waldenstrom macroglobulinemia. In fact, about 95% of patients with Waldenstrom macroglobulinemia has this mm -hmm. mutation. And there is a drug, ibrutinib, which inhibits bruton styrosine kinase, which is approved for the treatment of Waldenstrom macroglobulinemia. 
And in fact, there's been studies looking at ibrutinib for the treatment of primary CNS lymphomas because the great majority of primary CNS lymphomas have the same mutation that's present in Wallenstrom macroglobulinemia. And in fact, in this study, 94% of patients uh, show reductions in uh, the amount of tumor in the CNS. And you can see an example here. This is before ibrutinib treatment, after ibrutinib treatment, how the lesion essentially uh, is uh, significantly reduced in, in size with the treatment of, of ibrutinib. So the MYD88 mutation in primary CNS lymphoma is not only useful from a diagnostic point of view, it also opens the possibility of treatment with ibrutinib because tumors that have mutations in MYD88 are highly sensitive to uh, treatment with ibrutinib. So you could combine all this information and reach the conclusion that the future management of patients with CNS lymphoma could look something like this. There's an imaging uh, lesion suspicious for lymphoma. Do CSF CT DNA analysis. We already know that cytology and flow cytometry have low sensitivity, but we can also use uh, CSF CT DNA analysis and identifying the presence of the MYD88 L265P mutation will allow us to make a diagnosis of CNS lymphoma and uh, treat the patient with either high dose methotrexate or ibrutinib without the need to do a brain biopsy. Now, I'm going to give you an example of how this can be applied to patients that have brainstem gliomas. In 2016, uh, the WHO, there's a new entity called diffuse midline glioma H3K27M mutant. Previously, these tumors were um, classified as diffuse intrinsic pontine gliomas, and they're occurring children predominantly in children, involve midline structures, thalamus, brainstem, spinal cord. These tumors have H3, F3A, or histone 3, uh, K27M mutation, have a median survival of about one year. These tumors are not amenable to surgery because they diffusely involve the brainstem or, or the pons, and there's no effective treatment. You can see uh, here the imaging and the gross specimens showing uh, enlargement of, of the pons with this diffuse midline glioma. And these tumors are, are not one amenable to surgical resection. The histology is similar to glioblastoma. You see pseudopalisaline necrosis, vascular proliferation, pleomorphism, mitotic activity. And uh, sequencing studies have shown that a uh, large majority of these patients have H, uh, H3F3 mutations, mutations in H3.1.3 or mutations in H3.1. And there's also a high number of mutations in ACBR1. ACBR1 is also known as ALK2, and this is a kinase. And there are inhibitors available for this kinase that have shown beneficial effects in preclinical models for uh, diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma. So this could be a potential therapeutic target for, for the IPDs. Now, if we look at this H3K27M mutation, there's an antibody, a mutant-specific antibody. It can be used to identify tumors that have this mutation. Uh, and you can see here, this uh, tumor at the top was H3.3 wild type. So the mutant antibody does, does not stain the, the tumor tissue. And uh, under normal circumstances, this lysine 27, this K27 is uh, methylated. So this antibody against the methylated lysine shows diffuse staining of, of all the uh, tumor cells. Now, the case at the bottom, this patient has an H3.3 mutation. It's H3.3 mutant. So the mutant-specific antibody, the H3.3K27M specific antibody, highlights the tumor cells. But you can see that the endothelial cells, the blood vessels, are not staining. So, so the blood vessels do not have the mutation. Only the tumor cells have the mutation. Now, when the lysine 27 is mutated to methionine, it's no longer methylated. So the antibody that recognizes the methylated lysine 27 is negative. It's negative in the tumor cells, and you can see how the tumor is negative. However, the endothelial cells, which do not have the H3K27M mutation, retain the normal uh, methylation in lysine 27. So this H3K27M antibody is, is very useful in making the diagnosis of diffuse midline glioma H3K27M mutant. Now, 
it's also possible to detect this mutation in CSF. In this particular study, they look at six patients with diffuse midline gliomas, six children. They were able to evaluate the CSF in five out of these six patients by, uh, by sequencing. And the mutation, H3K27M mutation, was detected in the CSF in four out of five patients. Now, in the setting of a patient with an MRI showing uh, diffuse involvement of the brainstem, detection of the H3K27M mutation in the CSF will essentially allow you to make the diagnosis of diffuse midline glioma, H3K27M mutant, without the need to do a brain biopsy. If we look at this uh, gene, H3F3A, and we know that the K27M is the most common mutation, and that's shown here. There is another mutation that occurs in this gene in cancer, uh, is the G34R mutation. The H3K27M mutation is uh, frequent in midline uh, gliomas in children. The G34R mutation, or G34A, is frequent in hemispheric gliomas in children. If you look at what types of tumors have mutations in, in this gene, H3F3A, it's almost uh, exclusively primary central nervous system tumors, in particular 70% of the diffuse midline glioma. So it's not seen in other, in other tumor types. So identifying the H3K27A mutation in the CSF in combination with imaging and clinical information, is essentially diagnostic of a primary CNS tumor, particular diffuse midline glioma H3K27A mutant. So the future management of patients with diffuse midline gliomas could be something like this. Patient presents with an MRI showing expansion of the midbrain or, or the pons, um, take a CSF sample, test the CSF ctDNA for mutations, identify the H3K27M mutation, which, is, which allows you to make the diagnosis of diffuse midline glioma, H3K27M mutant, and because by next generation sequencing, we can analyze multiple genes. We can also analyze ACBR1 mutations, which may uh, open the possibility of uh, therapeutic uh, intervention, in particular inhibiting uh, ACBR1 mutation. And all of this is possible diagnosis and treatment determination without the need of having to do a brain biopsy. So just to add to the conclusions, a combination of clinical information, imaging characteristics, and CSF ctDNA analysis can be diagnostic in some patients with CNS malignancies. Now, I mentioned earlier at the beginning that CSF ctDNA can be detected in about 50% of patients with CNS tumors. So it doesn't work in 100% of the cases. And there are several factors that may influence the detection of CSF ctDNA. The method used, whether you're using digital PCR or next generation sequencing, there's some evidence that the tumor location, if the tumor is in close proximity to a ventricular space, may be more likely to detect uh, ctDNA in, in, in the CSF tumor volume, presence or absence of leptomeningeal disease, which genetic alterations are present, and history of treatment. So are there other biomarkers besides circulating tumor DNA that could provide information about a patient's tumor? For example, a messenger RNA, or, or microRNA or, or, or metabolites. And I'm just gonna give you some examples because there's data with microRNAs that is very uh, promising. MicroRNAs uh, uh, regulate the expression of numer numerous cancer-related genes. They can be detected in cerebrospinal fluid. This is a study that published the 50 most abundant microRNAs in CSF. Um, so, MicroRNAs have been shown to be altered in the CSF of patients with brain tumors. Uh, for example, in gliomas, there's alterations in uh, MIR-15B on, or MIR-21. Glioblastomas have shown alterations in uh, MIR-10B, also MIR-21, CNS lymphomas, shown alterations in MIR-19, MIR-21, MIR-92A. Uh, so there are alterations in uh, microRNAs in patients with CNS tumors. Uh, here's an example. In this particular study, they isolated CSF and they use uh, qRT-PCR to look at microRNAs, uh, microRNA 15B or microRNA uh, MIR-21 in patients with glioma controls, patients with primary CNS lymphoma or, or metastasis. You can see how uh, patients with glioma showed elevated levels of MIR-15B in CSF. Here, uh, 
patients with uh, primary sinus lymphoma or metastasis showed elevated levels of MIR-21 versus uh, there were low levels in control patients. So if you incorporate MIR-15b and MIR-21 into an algorithm, it's possible to distinguish patients with gliomas from patients with primary CNS lymphoma with uh, uh, a high degree of accuracy. Uh, this other study evaluated MIR-21 in patients with primary CNS lymphoma. MIR-21 is elevated in comparison to controls. MIR-19b is similarly elevated in patients with primary CNS lymphoma in comparison to controls. And MIR-92a is similarly elevated in the CSF of patients with primary CNS lymphoma in comparison to controls. So incorporating MIR-21, MIR-19b, 92a, it's possible to distinguish patients with primary CNS lymphoma from control patients with a high degree of uh, accuracy. Uh, accurately, uh, correctly diagnosing 95% of patients by just examining microRNA levels in the CSF. So microRNAs in CSF can provide information about a patient's CNS tumor and could supplement secreting tumor DNA analysis. So just to summarize, uh, it is possible that in the future in uh, the management of patients with central nervous system malignancies will incorporate analysis of mutations in, in CSF or analysis of microRNA levels in CSF, in particular uh, in patients with lymphomas or patients with midline gliomas, which are uh, CNS tumors that are not treated by, by surgery. Right? Uh, it takes CSF CTDNA, identified characteristic mutations, IDH1 or 132H mutation, which is highly characteristic of low grade gliomas, MYD88 mutation which is characteristic of uh, lymphomas or H3K27M mutation. It's characteristic of midline gliomas. This could be uh, supplemented by looking at microRNAs, for example. There are some metabolites. There's some evidence that shows that you can take uh, metabolites like T2 hydroxyglutaride, which is uh, produced by the mutant IDH1 enzyme in, in CSF as well, and reach a diagnosis of uh, uh, reach uh, the final uh, brain tumor diagnosis and make treatment decisions without the need of looking at tumor tissue in, in, in some cases. Uh, I want to acknowledge uh, a lot of the people. Some of the data that I show you is, is from my lab. I want to acknowledge uh, my, my research team and I'm happy to take uh, any questions. <laughs>